Hello, my friends, and welcome to The Bible in Order, where we are chronologically going through the entire Bible in one year. Today's reading for December 20th is 1 Peter. There are five chapters in this book. Peter is the apostle who writes this letter, and it's written to the chosen, the people of God who are sojourners around all the different regions. That word sojourner is very interesting. It's one who is traveling in a land where they do not belong, or at least where they are not from and where they do not plan to stay. These sojourners, these travelers from abroad, are chosen. They were predestined according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, according to the knowledge beforehand. God knew them before they existed, or perhaps before time began, or maybe both. As we read these letters, I become more and more curious about whether the people of God were actually literally known by God prior to the beginning of time, that perhaps God created our souls before he began the clock of time, that maybe that we, like Jesus, are from heaven originally, how else would God have known us before time began? And how else would we be sojourners from a distant place here temporarily, only to ultimately go back to the place where we came from and where we belong? With that in mind, we are to live as though we are sojourners, keeping in mind that we're not from here, we don't belong here, and therefore we should not conform to living the way the people who are from here, who do belong here, act. We were created for something more. Only let us live like it. Throughout this epistle, Peter encourages people to have an eternal perspective, to focus on our eternal reward, not on the things we can get in this life. And we do that by loving one another, it's one of the recurring motifs, and by denying ourselves and rejoicing in our afflictions, putting to death our flesh and embracing suffering. Rejoice in this coming salvation, he writes in verse 5, even though now for a short time it is necessary that we suffer grief in various trials so that the proven character of your faith, which is more valuable than gold, but like gold, must be refined in a fire. And it is through that refining fire that the gold becomes pure, cleansed of all impurities, all foreign substances that don't belong there. You, beloved, are much more valuable than gold. You are even more imperishable than gold. And just like this most precious metal, that is so glorious and beautiful in its purest form, you and I must be cleansed also, and we are cleansed through our suffering. We are purified through tribulation. We are made holy by enduring and persevering, knowing that all of these things happen to us, but even more than to us, they happen for us, so that we can be transformed and purified, cleansed of all unrighteousness, and gain that eternal perspective that we were created for. Set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. As obedient children, no longer set your mind on being conformed to the ways that you were when you acted in your ignorance beforehand. Now that you know better, remind yourself of this, dwell on this, focus on it, and let it become part of you. No longer do we desire material wealth or physical riches, but we desire a spiritual awakening. We long to be more and more aware of the eternal creatures that we are, that's being revealed as we are conformed into the image of God, as we deny our 
physical flesh, as we put the needs of other people before ourselves, as we look for opportunities to humble ourselves, we rejoice in this, that God has given us these opportunities to practice laying down our own lives to build others up. Since you have purified yourselves through your obedience to the truth, so that you show sincere brotherly love for one another, from a pure heart love one another earnestly. Earnestly could also be translated intently or strenuously. Perhaps the best translation of that word is actually fervently. Do we fervently love one another? The word picture is one of being stretched out to the point that it has nothing left to give. Are we stretching ourselves out to the point that we have no more to give when it comes to loving other people? Do this because you have been born again. Remember, your flesh, the body that you're currently living in, is like grass. It is temporary. It's here today and it's gone tomorrow. The grass withers and the flower fails, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, every and all kinds of slander. There we are again, being reminded to say nothing negative about anyone. Like newborn infants desire the word, the way a baby desires milk. It needs the milk to survive. It will not grow. It cannot live without the milk from its mother. Newborn believers are the same way. You cannot survive. You cannot grow. You cannot rest in God without the Word of God feeding your soul so that you can grow into the mature person God is calling you to be. It's another reminder here in Scripture that everything in this physical world that we see and touch and are so familiar with is just a picture as an example of showing us what spiritual life should be like. Let us devote ourselves to devouring the Word in the same way that a baby devours the milk from her mother. We are expected, we are called, we are instructed to grow up into our salvation. It's a reminder that salvation is just the beginning, it's not the end. Just like when a baby is born, it's not the end, it's not the culmination, it's just the beginning. Parenting really begins in a very real sense when that child is born. And then a parent must really continue dying to themselves, putting the needs of the child first. We are rejected by people, but we are accepted by the Lord. We are living stones, a spiritual house, the third temple, the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit of God. And we are being built to be a holy priesthood, the intermediaries between God and mankind all around us. But we're not offering physical sacrifices as the priests in the first or second temple did. No, we're offering spiritual sacrifices because Jesus once and for all purchased us back. He paid the price. There's no longer any need for a blood sacrifice, but there is a need for a spiritual sacrifice because that sacrifice is obedience, it is faith, it is choosing to obey God because we believe Him. And so we devote ourselves to Him. We devote ourselves to being changed into His image and to loving one another because He instructed us to do so. Again, in chapter 2, verse 9, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His possession, for God's possession, we belong to him because we were purchased at a price so that we may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Because we are 
strangers. We are sojourners. We are exiles. We don't belong in this world. Therefore, let us not be transformed into the image of this world. Instead, we are to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against the soul. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. It's a spiritual battle. Whether you realize it or not, the things that you focus on, the things that you do in your downtime, the ways you put your mind at ease, what you do with the technology that is so accessible in this day and time, everything we do is feeding one side or the other. And it must be top of mind that the sinful desires, the lust of the flesh, the things that the world does to make themselves feel better are waging war against the soul, both in the spiritual and in the physical. Do what is right. Love other people. Deny your flesh. Do what is good for it. And don't expect a reward. Actually, expect to be treated unfairly. Expect to suffer for doing what is right. And when you suffer for doing what is right and what is good, you will bring favor from God upon yourself. Isn't it better to have favor from God? Wives, live with your husbands. Submit to them. Adorn yourselves with the beauty of an unblemished character. Don't worry so much about your physical appearance. Husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way. Honor your wives. Remember and understand that they are co-heirs with you so that your prayers are not hindered. The way you treat other people will affect the way God listens to your prayers. If you are unloving and unrespectful, and not treating people the way God would have you to, it will impact your prayer life. It will impact how God responds to your prayers. But husbands, love your wives. Respect them. Give them the grace that they long for. Remember that they are your equals. That will remove the hindrance that is strangling your prayer life. Be ready at every time, at any time, to give a defense for the reason of the hope that lies within you. This is where we get the idea of apologetics, which is a defense of the faith through science, through logic, through reason, and there's always a place for that, but never neglect in chapter 3, verse 16, that we are to do that. We are to give that defense of the hope that lies within us with gentleness and with reverence. Let's remember, we are not looking to win an argument. We are looking to win our brother. Chapter 4, verse 13 says, Rejoice as you share in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may also rejoice with great joy when His glory is revealed. Again, maintaining that eternal perspective. Why? Because verse 17 says, For the time of judgment has come to begin with God's household. As Romans 1 says, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. If the Jewish people underwent judgment for their lack of faith and because of their disobedience, how much more so will we, having received grace, even be held to a higher standard? We will all face judgment. We will all give an account. We will all stand before God Most High. Chapter 5, verse 6 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you at the proper time casting all your cares upon him because he cares for you. Let us do that. Let us seek him. Let us ask him to give us the grace to walk in humility before him for his glory, for the advancement of his kingdom, and also for our good. God bless you, my friends. Thank you for being on this journey with me. We'll see you tomorrow.